All right, we are ready to start. Thank you everyone for joining us for the Yale Department of Radiology Grant Rounds today. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Miguel Hernandez Pampaloni from the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Pampaloni trained in Spain and at the University of Pennsylvania in nuclear medicine and has led efforts in cardiac nuclear imaging and PET MRI implementation into clinical practice at UCSF. He is a master researcher and educator, having led the Nuclear Medicine Fellowship and the Nuclear Medicine Section and trained many nuclear medicine physicians that are now employed across the country. Dr. Pampaloni will be presenting his experience with implementing PET MRI into clinical workflow at UCSF. Thank you, Dr. Pampaloni. And Thank we you. will we will address the questions at the end of your presentation. So I'll be keeping track of them. Thank you, Dr. Aboya. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and to share our, our experience. Uh, so during the next uh, 45 minutes, the goal will be essentially to go over, there's nothing to disclose from my end. Essentially during the next 45 minutes, I plan to uh, review our, our experience here at UCSF with the implementation of our PEDMR system, mainly in a clinical setting, but also a little bit on the research setting because almost by definition, so this device um, comes with uh, a research component due to the nature of the hybrid uh, techniques that they share. So essentially, one of the things that I wanted to uh, emphasize is when to do a clinical PEDMR and when to do a research PEDMR. So um, essentially, the research PEDMR is, I think, very useful and should be uh, one of the, of the goals of using this technique, when we can answer a question by simultaneously evaluating the same process or different processes that can be imaged with these two different techniques. One, one technique is much more anatomical, but can be also very functional. The other one is more molecular, more bio, biochemical, if you want to say that. From the clinical perspective, when do you want to do that? Essentially, when there are situations when you can extract the maximum information from every single imaging technique, and that is going to modify the management of the patients. I plan to talk about three different things during this time. One will be essentially the advantages of using PEDMR in the clinic today versus other imaging techniques based on our experience. So the second one is, is review of our current clinical applications that we are doing. And the third one, some of the challenges that the implementation of this system would carry to the department and to the logistics, et cetera. So the background, so we both know, everybody knows that these two techniques are combining anatomic information from one end and the more molecular imaging information from the PET system in only one imaging. So essentially what, what is a product of this PET-MR is only one imaging. And, but the concept of this PET-MR is not new. Actually, the concept of the PET-MR precede the concept of the PET-CT. However, the, the implementation of, of PET-MR was much more difficult due to a, a lot of technical challenges related essentially to uh, the ability to detect the positrons within a magnetic field that was much more difficult to achieve when compared to uh, the standard PET CT that the CT was much more easier also because of the CT attenuation maths. So essentially the PET MR did not become a, a reality until the end of the 2005, 2007. What is the system that we have? So we have a system, there are two systems in the market. There are two different vendors. Uh, our vendor is a G system, is a G Sigma PMR that combines a 3T Tesla with a four ring digital pet. They are combined together in only one gadget. At the end of 2013, we started doing research on this scanner. And the only reason is because there was no FDA approval until September of 2014, when we started doing 
some clinical patients as well. So this is actually the first patient that we did. And it, it is more anecdotal that I want to show you because there is always the first one. This is the first coronal use of, of, the, of the patient with, um, with MR at the, at the pet that we did, essentially, mostly a whole body from the, from the vertex to the mid thighs and oncology patients. So during the next few minutes, during the next half an hour, we're going to see many of these images. And, and the main concept for you to remember is that the fact that the simultaneous per MR, and, and the term simultaneous is until a certain extent not entirely accurate because we, as we, we know that the acquisition of these two images occur in parallel. Mm, and sometimes even the sequences of the MR are performed before or after uh, the acquisition of the, of the PET. You can do the simultaneous view, but on the clinical setting, it's not unusual that we do that on a, on, a, mm, on a systematic view, one after the other. But essentially, the question is that we are going to have multiple MR sequences, depending on the clinical question that needs to be answered in combination with a molecular imaging at the same time. So the goal, like in this particular patient with a metastatic cheese with multiple peritoneal implants, is to better characterize the findings, taking advantage of the clinical benefits that both techniques have in that particular part of the body. And this is an important thing to remember. The reason for that, the reason for that is remember because we need to consider two different things here. When we are, especially on the logistic side, there are considerations in terms of protocoling, in terms of workflow, and in terms of the technologies, ability to perform these imaging studies. It's much more complex uh, also logistically to perform a PET-MR than a PET-CT. So essentially, as probably you already understand, and I really saw that from the first images, the clear indications in my mind for both of the studies combined in the oncology arena, they are not designed by the tumor type, but rather by the study type. Because you want to maximize the ability of the technique to visualize that particular process in that particular part of the body. In other words, the MR, for instance, is, should be the standard of care for, for the pelvis, for part for the liver, for the head and neck. But for the chest, perhaps you are better off in the oncology with the city of the chest. So that you need to really tailor your um, applications based on, on the ability of your imaging technique to maximize the results. So that's why in terms of the protocol for, from the MR perspective, we tend to talk about abdomen, pelvis, brain, spine, cardiac, instead of the tumor type. And from the PET, much more general, because the protocols are usually based on doing whole bodies, doing limited PET imaging of the brain, or PET imaging of the heart or the chest, slightly different. This is just an idea, and, and you're very familiar with all these protocols, but you can see that from the order on the left side of the table, to the type of study that you want to do. And then the protocol, they are quite different. They are quite different in, in terms of a PET MR whole body with the liver, as we, as we would see, will be a whole body PET and liver MR. But then the protocol might be different, might be depending on the contrast you are using, or an MR of the pelvis, depending on what is the process that you're going to do. Is somebody that is a suspicion of having a rectal cancer, or is more a GU neoplasia? So those protocols are the ones that at the very end are going to design, are going to define how you uh, organize your workflow. And that is in very close relationship with the technologies expertise uh, that I mentioned and, uh, and that we'll talk about in a few minutes. In terms of the, of the protocol time, well, some of MR protocols, as you know, may be as long as 40 minutes. So they, they can be long depending on, so the whole body pad in oncology, or, I mean, right now, with the new stand, state of the arts machines, they are down to 20 minutes. They can also go lower than that. You can do that probably 12 minutes in the new scanners, 
or you can do 15, 20 minutes depending on playing with the dose. Lo lower dose, slightly longer acquisition, slightly higher dose, uh, shorter acquisition time. So the question is that then you don't want to really keep somebody on the scanner, especially on the mouse scanner, for more than an hour for multiple reasons, as you can imagine. It's not always a very pleasant situation to be. Hmm? Because it's not either very practical from a, a workflow standpoint, keeping a scanner busy for one hour when you're doing only one study. So what are some or potential solutions to achieve that? Well, you can streamline some of the MR protocols. You're reducing them to probably 20, 25 minutes, and perhaps even do shorter sequences on the MR. It's much more difficult to reduce the time of the pet. Hmm? So essentially, our experience is that our studies, even though they were tailored to be done maybe 45, 60 minutes, they actually took much longer than that. They took almost one hour and a half because there was a learning curve in terms of the logistics, in terms of doing the protocol, and in terms of doing the sequences, et cetera, et cetera. Now, most of our studies are done I would say between 45 and 60 minutes. Technology training is very important. The refinement of protocols to be adapted to this particular type of hybrid technology, which is a, a slightly different that the individual protocols of every, ma every machine were are done um, individually. The hiccups, hiccups related to, so the patient's ability to sustain the imaging of, of, of the time, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? So, so essentially, the setup, I mean, we were always trying to do that relatively rapidly, but it can take up to 15, 20 minutes, right? Ideally, you dedicated them all, you want to really reduce that as much as possible to do dedicated sequences that are going to be more useful. Let's uh, leave apart the financial portion of that, the part that you would be able to build. And then the whole body pad, that's going to take you 15, 20 minutes from start to bottom between the patient in and out. So essentially, so you're familiar with this, depending on the whole body pad usually is done from, from the vertex to the mid thigh, sometimes from the vertex to the toes, and it takes X amount of time. Now, we don't have a CT for attenuation mapping here. What are we going to use here? For, I mean, for the MR, we need to use probably the Dixon sequence that we use for creating some attenuation map. But at the same time, we want to do some dedicated MR depending on what is the what is, is a clinical question that needs to be answered. Let's do a whole body plat plus a liver MR, and then the liver MR will contain all the sequences that a typical MR of the liver have. So that is what is creating more complexity because we'll be doing a whole body pad with some MR sequences for attenuation correction, and then we'll be doing a dedicated MR of the area of the body that has the main clinical question to answer. Because we cannot do in all the patients a whole body MR with all the sequences. That is totally impractical. Hmm? An example is, for, for instance, and we will see these cases in, in a few minutes, for example, the rectal cancer. So the rectal cancer, we will have some sort of sequences that are totally individual to the rectal cancer sequence or the MR that are different from the liver. And so that what the expertise of the technologies and the way the studies are protocol is very really important because to really organize your uh, uh, clinical workflow in a matter that that you don't, you are not stopped, and you are not really slowed down in the day, because there are one or two studies that are, that are, are going to put you very behind in the time. So essentially, one of the situations that in the PET-MR occurs rather often, and is different from the PET CT, is that typically on the PET-MR when you do a MR, you are not going to do the legs. So, so the legs, unless you are really asking for the legs for um, an MSK or or a biomechanical um, problem. That is not part of the, of the typical question, but in patients undergoing um, PET-CTs, for instance, patients with myeloma, patients with uh, skin cancers, some even patients, some patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, the PET-CT routinely goes to the toes. So that obviously creates some issues in the way that needs to be performed, needs to be performed in a different way. So then you need a separate PET-MR for the for the legs, that means that you are going to spend more time with the patients there. And that sometimes is an issue for patients with multiple myeloma, patients with melanoma, if you are doing these techniques on them. 
We mentioned the attenuation correction. The attenuation correction is something that intrinsically was one of the major problems with the, uh, the registration of, of the breathing as well another major problem for the gating in the cardiac arena for the implementation of this thing. Essentially, when you when in the 1990s we will be using pet only machines, that probably didn't exist because we were doing the emission and then we will do a scouting with a, a, a germanium um, a rod outside of the body, creating the silhouette of the body for the attenuation map. With the PET CTs, there is no problem whatsoever. We use the CT attenuation map. Now, when we use the MR, the situation becomes much more difficult because different portions of the body will have different problems with the attenuation. For the brain, it's not a problem because the brain is not going to move, it's within this box defined by the skull, but the mediastinum, the chest, is, is very problematic. The diaphragmatic area could be a problem, especially the top of the liver. So those areas really require a different approach in terms of the, in terms of the attenuation. I'm going to talk to you about now some of the clinical applications, some of the things that we are we are doing, and at the end I will mention you also the also the frequency of how we are doing them. So in intracranial tumors, we are doing that relatively uh, uh, not very often from the clinical perspective, because so we know that there is no a lot of a room in terms for the for the pet per, in, in, in per se. Because the MR is the is the modality of choice, the standard of care. Only situations after initial post chemo radiation or even post surgical, when the when the clinical question is related to the presence of necrosis, then is when the clinical ability of doing a combined simultaneous uh, FDG per MR on the clinical setting may be may be useful. And the reason is, as you can imagine, is essentially patient convenience, because it's much easier to do everything with a patient it's in one scanner than rather having to move them around. Several pet agents are in the process of being investigated. Um, um, we've been very active in this area. And, and I will show you a couple of cases that are also important to trigger the research question for them. For example, there have been f -miso in looking at the hypoxia of the tumors, fluorodopa, Fluoro, fluorothimidin or even uh, fluorothyrosine in, in, glio, in glioblastomas. This is this is an example. This is an example of a patient with a long history of, of the history of lung cancer with prior brain metastasis and now now recurrence. Okay, so we know that there's very likely to be some something abnormal there. And when you do the combination of the both, and the the fact that it's very easy to overlap. Uh, the uptake of FDG, that area that is very bright, in the in, in in a portion of the area that was suspected to contain only necrosis, the combination of the two gives you simultaneously on the same time and uh, the the information mm -hmm. that is also helpful. This is one of the of the research protocols that we've been doing in glioblastomas is the utilization of fmiso um, fluorimidazole as a tracking of hypoxic tissue. So in, in the setting of before and after the therapy with uh, bevuzumab. So essentially the, this area that is clearly there with it, the, the enhancement has significantly declined one week after. And also the signal from the FMIZO, meaning the volume of hypoxic tissue has also significantly declined one week after the therapy with a vast. So this is an, an example of the research applications in, um, in brain tumors because you take the benefit of combining on the same time, at the same time, both techniques without delay and much better patient experience. This is another example, not using FMISO. This is using fluorodopa. This is using fluorodopa. And what we're looking at here, what we're using here is patients with a metastatic breast cancer showing in the right hemisphere of the, of the cerebellum status post gamma knife the presence of mm, mm, uh, uh, lesions right there. So it's a combination of multiple agents that you can test, you can validate them, and you can test them in real time with standard of care imaging of MR. That is one of the major advantages that in neurosciences you can use. What about in head and neck cancers? Well, in head and neck cancers, um, we've been doing several feasibility studies, essentially to visualize the ability to 
to restage these patients better and easier with PEDEMA. And essentially the main, the main goal was, was the fact that when you do the PET-CT and the MR in different scanners, then you need to align them. It's not a difficult and impossible thing to align them, but sometimes hey, five, six, seven millimeter cervical nodes, they might not be in the same position when you do the FTG that typically is done maybe in a different day. So the patient preparation may be slightly different and then the results could be different when, when compared to the time when the patient underwent the MR. So that is, um, is, a, is something to keep in mind. We have a, a, a relatively limited experience of that because it, um, and we have like a, a dozen or 15 patients that see no significant difference besides the patient, patient comfort, which I think is, is quite relevant. Applications will be situations after after initial therapy, when the clinical question is more residual disease, recurrent disease, or perineural spread. This is important because the alignment is very difficult with, a, with PET CT in very tight spaces. Hmm? Incidentally, incidentally, noted patients with the right tonsil mass that underwent a whole body MR. So this is not a study that is also a study of the brain. One of the advantages of the PET MR is that you can do a dedicated brain MR a clinically with all the clinical sequences with your FTG, and then you can also do on the same setting the rest of the body, which also with the FDGs already injected. So that is one of the one of the advantages. Right? So this is the, on the left the MIP images of the same patient that we acquired practically immediately after the brain. So this is one of the advantages. Right? And the quality of, of, of the of the of the PET images is very satisfactory. It's very satisfactory because I mean right now we have refined our attenuation map in most part of the bodies when that can achieve practically the same results as, as a PET CT. No regional lymph nodes, no metastasis, good for the patient. All right. What happened in the situation of the liver? Well, in, in the liver, we have a limited role here from, from the FDG perspective, okay? not from the MR perspective, but the FDG perspective has a, a limited role because most of the HCCs, they tend not to be FDG habit unless they're very really differentiated. And, and same thing for the cholangio carcinoma, <coughs> but they are very useful techniques in patients after initial days or initial um, initial therapy. Now, the utilization of the FDG is very is very useful for looking at nodal metastasis or even distant metastasis in the lung, in the bones, etc. While the MR is much more tailored and should be done to look for the liver itself. So essentially, this technique could be very useful for pre-surgical planning because you have your standard care imaging of the liver, the MR, and then you have a very good technology on the same setting that is gonna see the entire body that is the FDG to rule out the presence of metastasis, right? When you um, use hepatobiliary agents for surgical planning, then you have both, both words, the anatomic assessment that's gonna be very useful and the assessment for metastasis. Most of the tumors that we use in the liver are FDG for mostly of the, of the carcinomas. Right now, with uh, the um, uh, development and the implementation in the clinical setting of um, dotatate and, and gallium-68 and other agents that are targeting neuroendocrine tumors for targeting somatostatin receptors, now we have opened that also to the, to the neuroendocrine tumors. So essentially, as we mentioned before, when we are doing a dedicated image of the liver, that is in combination with a whole body PET. So we need to focus MR. The focus MR is the one that is essentially in the liver. We are not doing a focus MR of the pelvis. We are not doing a focus MR of the chest. We do that all of the liver in the same in the same setting with all the sequences that typically are used clinically. Hmm? And try not to significantly increase the timing that the patients are within this within the scan. All right, one of the situations that from the very beginning um, was very intriguing is the fact that the motion correction algorithms in all the areas surrounding the diaphragm, that including the liver was always a kind of a small issue. And that actually with all the improvement that came out during the last three or four years, now there is significant improvement in motion correction with PEDMR of the liver when, com when compared to the PET CTs. So this is a, a very um, interesting thing to do. And the extended PET time may also improve the lesion detection. What does it mean? Meaning that because you are waiting longer 
because if you are doing sometimes an MR of the liver or sequences of the liver, you have the ability to essentially to extend and to see smaller lesions with more FDG uptake that you may not necessarily see at 45 minutes. This is one of the potential advantages. This is a situation that we had with a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. So um, you see that image of three minus PET image without motion correction on the left. This is a dotatate, gallium 68, PET imaging, neuroendocrine tumors, lesion in the liver, very clearly defined. Nothing to say about that on, on the dotatate. Dot Everybody will see that, very dark. Then what happened when we do 15 minutes image PET with motion correction? Well, there is something else. There is something else that we didn't see before. That is that lesion that is much more lateral and close to the liver capsule. This is something that is, is an advantage of these techniques right now. Because of the apl application of very advanced motion correction algorithms, you can detect much smaller lesion, even with FDG, in, in the liver. That is a big advantage that we didn't have and we don't have with the PET CT. With, hmm, very small lesions in the liver, but very, very bright on the dotatate, certainly a metastatic. This is another case that we have with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. And the patient from the top to the bottom went from, from a PET CT to a PET MR. So essentially, with multiple lesions in the liver, this is a situation where the PET MR is going to better characterize some of the lesions in the liver due to the fact that you are doing dedicated MR sequences of the liver. However, because the amount of metastasis this patient have is probably in the range of half a dozen or even more than that, the clinical management is not going to um, be modified significantly because there is not going to be segmentectomy or partial hepatectomy of this patient. But it's to give you an example how the better characterization of multiple hepatic lesions with PET, dotatate is very useful because some of the lesions actually might not be necessarily tumor, as we will see in a second. This is another patient with a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. You see the differences here, okay? CT versus uh, the different MR on, on the D WI, you have a significant amount of restriction uh, that on the initial mm, uh, arterial phase is clearly visible, but hypodense on the, on, the, on the venous phase. On the other hand, on the total talk, in, in this case, is the analog or, or the tate that we did, is, is completely cold. So that is very likely a metastasis that was already treated, that is no longer, is no longer active. Hmm? Well, situations that we have, patients with neuroendocrine tumors as well. We are doing a significant number of them on, on the, on the PET-MR and, and, and on the PET-CT as well. Better characterization of lesions that are more difficult to see on the MR. The standard MR sequences are not, we're not able to identify until you do the fat suppression that you'll see the bony lesion that the patient had in the lumbar vertebra in L2. That is, is a very positive uh, skeletal lesion very clearly see on the dotted date, much more difficult to see in the standard sequences of the paramour. Hmm? And characterizations, as I mentioned, of hepatic lesions in the endocrine tumors. This is a classic example of patients with hemangiomas, liver hemangiomas that they might not be, even though with a relatively small restriction on, on some of the images. And the transitional phase and the hepatobiliary phase has that area that is, is very dark in the center. But look at the situation here with the Dota talk. Dota talk is completely, completely negative. There is absolutely no signal. It's also hypodense when compared to the rest of the hepatic parenchyma. This is very classic and almost pathognomonic based on the Dota talk that is, is um, a, a liver hemangioma and is not a metastasis. Hmm? What about on pancreatic cancer? Pancreatic cancer still probably CT in many institutions remains the preferred surgical technique for assessment of, of disease, right? Is is an evolving is an evolving field, um, and the PEDMR I think may be very beneficial in in assessment of, of the treatment responders and especially individuals with liver metastasis. Now, because the total lesion glycolysis, which is visualized with the FDG, and the ADC values measured with MR may very well predict their response before the tumor morphology changes. So those values are very useful, potentially in the clinical setting. This is an example of that on a patient with a big pancreatic cancer tumor uh, doing on the PEDMR with a 
not easy to see on these frequencies and hepatic, hepatic metastasis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the same patient. So we are not doing a lot of patients with pancreatic cancer because most of our patients with pancreatic cancer, they go to the pet CT. But it's something that for after uh, initial therapy or, or to assess potential liver metastasis, I think it could be a, a technique that is, uh, is very useful depending on, on each institution. Now we're moving into the pelvis, an area where the pet MR excels. For, for, for the reason, because the MR is becoming the standard of care for most of the, of the of the pelvic uh, neoplasia. One of the, of the things that we have here is in ovarian cancers, uh, cervical, mm, endometrial cancer, prostate cancer, and, and rectum. So this is where the, it, it is a territory of the MR. So there is a very clinical indication for using this particular technique and taking advantage of both when combined with the PET. On the cervical cancer, it can be essentially very well used in the initial stages due to the very high sensitivity of the MR on this situation but and the ability for the FDG pad on this um, on this on these patients to detect um, distant metastases that are not seen on the dedicated MR and it's probably much better than 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 the CT. Now the question that you may have: What about the patients with potential um, pulmonary nodules that are they are they are small, they are under under the resolution of the FDG and may not be entirely well characterized with MR? These remain. A clinical question to you, but if, they, if the question is for initial staging, so I think that probably the uh, the, the ability of this technique to combine them in only one is is um, is very valuable for surveillance as well. It's it's, it's used. It's very uh, FDG is fantastic for uh, for restaging for assess response to therapy and for surveillance. And the MR, especially in the pelvis, is particularly useful because sometimes there are some pitfalls. As you know, some FDG areas of uptake in the pelvis that are not necessarily tumor, and they are much better characterized with a dedicated MR. Mm -hmm. This is one of the cases that we have, a 36-year-old female with newly diagnosed, um, newly diagnosed cervical cancer, underwent dedicated MR of the, of the pelvis uh, with this two centimeter mass without parametrical extension whatsoever. FDG uptake, as you can see by that arrow, it's in the cervical mass was no evidence of nodal and distant metastasis. They are not seen on the screen, but the distant metastasis are seen because the FDG is monitoring the entire rest of the body. This is what, this is a perimara patient with a 48 year old still cervical cancer status for surgery. Okay, now it's presenting with a palpable mass on the exam, all right? We have the MRT1 postcon on the left. We have the PET-MR combination there on the right. And what do we have here? We have that area that is not clearly exactly what it is, but it's a recurrent cervical cancer. The recurrent cervical cancer seen with that area that is very increased uptake is not the ureter, is not a bladder diverticulum, is not a corpus luteum, and it's not an, an annexal mass. This is a recurrent, a recurrent finding. This is something again very similar. When you put the fuse of the of the FDG and, and the MR on the left, when combined to the MR only on the other side, so it's much more difficult and better characterize these retroperitoneal lymph nodes when you combine them. Both. Especially when the RP nodes are small, when they are six, seven, eight millimeters, but they are very avid, then you have a much more, much better grip in really characterizing them and knowing what they are. So rectal cancers, the benefits of the MR, we mentioned that already. And for the T-staging and for the regional assessment of lymph nodes is fantastic. The FDG pad, I think it's not the standard of care for the initial staging, but it's very good for detection of RP nodes and regional metastasis and, and distant metastasis. And the MR is also, and it should be the standard of care, I think, for liver assessment. Hmm? So this is a patient that with the, uh, with the MIP images of, of the FDG there, with that area that is posterior, uh, that is essentially primary, primary, primary tumor no way there. So essentially what are the benefits of this technique is that they can up, upgrade and upstage the patient or, or, or not change it at all because if they are negative for um, other uh, metastasis or, or lymphadenopathy. So that is the advantage in only one setting you can do, you can do essentially both. Now, so prostate cancer, prostate cancer, uh, dedicated amount of the prostate, practically nobody will, uh, will argue that now it's a standard of care for staging and restaging of, of, of the patients that didn't undergo uh, radical prostatectomy and also for, for, uh, for regional um, pelvic uh, uh, relapse. On the PET side, on the PET side, 
there has been in the last 15 years a lot of interest in that due to the ability of high uh, overexpression of multiple an um, antigens in the surface of the prostate cells or, or the cancer cells. And there's been a lot of uh, interest using C11 fluorocolin, using fluorocolin and the axomin, and the fluzicobin that is now FDA approved, and now using the PSMA agents using either gallium 68 or fluoranitin that are already in the market. And they've been one of them with gallium uh, approved in a, um, at the beginning of the year, and probably the one with fluorine will be approved at, in, in, at the end of May. So that is essentially making a lot of uh, indications, especially in patients that are high risk patients with glycerin of four plus four and, and above, on patients with biochemical recurrence, those patients with a progressively increase of the PSA. Very, very useful technique. We, we've done tons of them. Uh, we are doing really a lot of patients with, um, uh, with, uh, um, with prostate cancer, either high risk prostate prostatectomy or biochemical recurrence. This is an example of a patient high risk prostatectomy. Unfortunately for the patient, multiple PSMA which is a protein that is a, is a transmembrane protein in the overexpressed in adenocarcinoma of the prostate, is also present in the normal prostate cells, but is overexpressed in adenocarcinoma. That's why we see them. There is no reason why you have PSMA uptake in other parts of the body. That is not entirely true because we've seen that the expression of this protein in, in, in patchy disease and anecdotically also in other tumors such as lung cancer and even even gliomas. But this particular patient, as you can see, has lymph, lymph node metastasis and ulcer metastasis that are seen with, with that. Patients coming back after prostatectomy with, with, um, with a PSA of 0.8 after prostatectomy. Okay, these are the dedicated T1 postcon images showing that particular area that now you have, you are practically certain that that PSMA uptake is a local recurrence. There is no doubt about it. The good thing about that is that the patient did not have any regional or osseous pelvic lesions, but the recurrence is there. Now, with PSMA, we can detect probably patients with um, a PSA that is 0.5 um, for biochemical recurrence in combination with MR. I think this is really the technique that for these high risk patients is, is, uh, is fantastic. Metastatic prostate cancer is the same thing, but this. We are not using PSMA. This is we are using we are using FDG. FDG that is not particularly useful um, for prostate cancer. Only situations when the prostate cancer is already de differentiated and, and the prostate cancer has passed the androgen anti um, androgen castration sensitivity is no longer sensitive to IPT therapy. Then these patients will become very FDG heavy. And an example is like this: mm -hmm. multiple hepatic metastases that they are seen. This is a gallium PSMA with a patient with a retro urethral lesion that is not clearly seen, but is clearly the ability of the PSMA here is the culprit. Eh? It's giving you the answer that that is a lesion. There is no question about it. This is another patient of our clinic with truly, there is a significant amount of PSMA in the, in the prostate. This is a patient with high risk pre prostatectomy, but already there are two lymph nodes in the area surrounding the prostate in the superior pelvis, as you can see. This is another example when, when, when gallium PSMA is starting to become important because sometimes it's negative. So the, P, the PET CT um, was absolutely unremarkable, but as you can see on the MR, that area in the peripheral zone is highly suggestive, even with a faint uptake of PSMA that is visible, very suggestive of a recurrence in a patient with initial diagnosed uh, a couple of years ago. Hmm? Moving into areas of the whole body applications. Okay, for lymphomas and multiple myelomas. For lymphomas, essentially, the, the PET-CT is the standard of choice, is the standard of care. Situations in the pediatric arena is changing. There are many centers that are, are starting to use PET-MR to monitor patients with lymphoma because the radiation exposure to the pediatric population is less. Multiple myeloma, very interesting. We've been doing a growing number of cases because of the uh, local interest of our oncologists, essentially the combination of metabolic information from the FDG and the dedicated spine MRs. This is because most of the patients are bony disease. So dedicated spine MR with stereo sequences, these are the ones that are probably the best combination 
to have almost an entire whole body MR plus an FTG in the same in the same set. Mm, so that is important to understand. Yeah? Um, let's see non oncologic applications. Okay, for non oncologic applications, let's talk a little bit about neurology, cardiac, and also we talk about our experience a little bit with in, in hyperparathyroidism. In epilepsy, okay, in epilepsy, uh, the usefulness of the FDG is based on the fact that on real time you know the area of the MR and that is on the same. You don't have to fuse, you don't have to do any sort of change. Um, however, not all epileptic focus are going to be seen on the MR alone, and the FDG is also doable right now on an interictal phase. For dementia situations or neurodegenerative diseases, e either using FDG or using any other um, amyloid seeker agents for beta purifier, beta 10, or tau agents, now they are becoming interesting to do them at the same time as the MR to really situations like the differentiation with frontotemporal dementia, et cetera, that can be, can be clinically interesting. And so this is, a, this is a situation of a patient that we have in our clinic, that we have the MR on the left and the fused images on the, on the rainbow with, um, with the FDG. Well, it's very difficult to see on the MR that that far hippocampal blurring, but there is asymmetrical decrease uptake of the FDG on the left side when compared to the right side, you as you can see, marked by the arrows. This area is much less activity when compared to the right. What is the advantage of doing the MR at the same time? That is at the at same time, same metabolic conditions, there is no movement, it's easy. In my mind, in the brain, I think that the use of the PEMR, the main gold mine or the PEMR in the brain is for neurobiology and sequel neuropharmacologic applications. Real time assessment of receptor imaging, and, and, and here we can talk for decades, cocaine, schizophrenia, multiple situations that you can tailor with dedicated MR so you can see functional changes as well, bio, biochemical changes over the brain. It's something that is, um, is a field that is evolving very rapidly. This, uh, this is moving very rapidly. So in, in, in terms of the, um, I don't know why it's moving so quickly, but I, 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 will, I will explain to you. So this is essentially on the, on the fluorocolon. So the fluorocolon for the parathyroid, this is an endeavor that we've been doing for the last seven years. Fluorocolin, as we mentioned, was initially used in the, in the prostate cancer because it's overexpressed and because of the higher synthesis of amino acid for the, for the tumor cells. But because there is an increased amount of phospholipid calcium NPC protein kinases in parathyroid adenomas, these are taken up by the fluorocalling. And then it could be a very useful technique to detect parathyroid adenoma with the PEMR. The combination of the two is much better than the single one. Adenoma or not adenoma on the MR, who knows? But now with the fluorocalling, it's practically sure that this is an adenoma, a single adenoma in the right inferior. The sensitivity of this technique for us tops 90, 95 percent um, is a very good technique when combined both sequences um, you don't have the radiation exposure is much less than you say that you have to do a full DCT for instance and and the and the image the quality of the images is really fantastic on the this uh, and some examples of our clinic right in pure adenomas um, and this is a result of, of two examples that we have here I don't know why it's moving so quickly uh, but in two examples that you have there with um, with system EB images that were not um, were not clear but barely visible on the on the fluorocol you have right there, right? So this is another example with the system. Now on the cardiac arena, what advantages beside the patient comfort? Uh, because the cardiac arena is 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 complex. It's probably the most difficult part of the body because the heart is moving. There's a lot of um, uh, artifacts and, and gating problems related to the cardiac motion, to the respiratory motion, to the diaphragm, and the blood is moving inside the heart. So it's not easy. So it's certainly an advantage for the patients if we are doing the images only in one setting, much more advantages as anything else. And, and I would say that probably, I, I mean, right now, there are certain situations where it appears to be useful, situations when you are going to maximize the use of the MR, for instance, situations like delayed enhancement in, in, in patients with infiltrative diseases, 
amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, in combination with PET and the same setting. Better characterization of subendocardial inflammation with FDG, with amyloid as well, for, for instance, with sodium fluoride. You can, we can combine those in situations of a PET MR for a, a combination of microcirculatory dysfunction, looking at the myocardial flow reserve with the PET, and at the same time with perfusion agents, we can have doing CINE or uh, even delayed enhancement in patients with MR to look for changes in left ventricular volume, dilatation, population could be patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, patients with uh, hemothelia. So, so these are potential applications that are there right now. They are not yet entirely in the clinical setting because there are a lot of logistics issues that are related as well, unfortunately, to the finances and to the billing. But in, 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 for the appropriate cohort of patients, there are some applications that are still there. Mm -hmm. The challenges, as I mentioned, remain, I mean, we are, we are going there, but it's sometimes respiratory and cardiac agent remains a problem. So the PET-MR in pediatrics, so we already mentioned that the decreased radiation that is essentially coming from the CT is no longer present. We don't have to do it. And then with the improved motion correction algorithms on the PET-MR, that is becoming much more attractive right now. We can also decrease the dose of the radio tracer of the FDG, giving three, five millicuries maximum. What is your volume? I mentioned to you at, that at the end, well, our volume, clinical volume, most of our patients are oncology patients. And most, most of them that we do are patients with gallium dotatate uh, or FDG. And what are the indications? Mainly prostate, mainly uh, um, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer for restaging or rectal cancer. Epilepsy, we do a fair number of cases. We also do a, a fair number of patients with multiple myeloma and some of them with head and neck. What are the challenges of the PEREMA? We already mentioned some of them in the next three or four slides, final slides of the presentation. I will go through. So essentially, one challenge that you have when implementing a new technique that is hybrid and that uses two different techniques that are very different, that are, are, are complementary, but that are, are, are very complex, both of them. You need the expertise uh, that you may not have in only one technology. You may need two technologies to run one of the PET and one of the MR components, or you can have technologies that are training both. That is the best situation. Another challenge is that in many settings, still PET MR is seen as something experimental, something that's research. As a matter of fact, you talk to many oncologists and they will tell you that, hey, but PET MR is not included in any NCCM guidelines. It's not part of the standard of care. And so sometimes it's difficult. You need to educate the benefits of, of, of of the technique. And also the fact that we talk about that as well, that in some situations in oncology for follow-up patients, the presence of pulmonary nodules remains a little bit of a problem because the CT remains the standard of care. And okay, I mean, right now we have evolved a lot and have been able to detect pulmonary nodules with different sequences of MR, including the ultra short echo time that are almost at the same time as the or the same ability that the, that the CT, but still for very small pulmonary nodules, somebody that you want for surveillance, lymphoma patients, patients with melanoma, the chest, I have to say, it remains, especially the lungs, a little bit of a challenge because some patients may need a dedicated CT of the chest, even without contrast. Hmm? Finally, where do we move from here for what we have understood and learned in the last seven, eight years. Well, I mean, we know that is an exciting uh, field because both imaging techniques are very exciting. They, they are complementary in many ways. They um, answer different questions, but they also are very challenging. Um, so that is, we have new, new tracers that are coming down the pipeline for clinical, for research application. At the same time, M, new MR sequences. So that I think is a, is a stimulus to really develop a new, uh, new techniques to combine and to take the best information possible. I will say that the clinical applications will be ultimately very on site specific. It will be very dependent on the expertise, the interest of every single site and volume. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it happens everywhere, but with this particular technique is even more because we are combining two techniques 
that are complex. Uh, the clinical data are still developing, though there are more and more scanners that have been implemented at many centers. We don't have the same amount of information that we have with PET, with CT, or even with PET CT combined. In some instances, especially for some dedicated applications, we may need to go into much larger multicenter trials to see the real benefits of using this combination on a simultaneous on a simultaneous way. And as I mentioned before, we need to gain a little bit of more acceptance, not only from referring physicians, but, but also from some of us, some of the imagers that may be a little bit reluctant and sometimes even skeptic about the implementation of this. Hmm? That is my last slide. I wanna thank you all for, for your attention. And now I'm open to any, any question. I'm gonna stop the share so I can, I can see. Thank you, Dr. Pampaloni. Uh, this is a great presentation. Um, we have uh, one question in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, can you do 3D sequences in the pelvis with PETMR? Yes. Um, I, I don't see any more questions, uh, but I did have a question in terms of um, um, in terms of um, implementation and uh, having high enough clinical throughput of the PETMR and good use of PETMR. Um, I remember that there were there's anesthesia that's available for the PETMR uh, at UCSF. How do you how how do, um, how critical do you think it is to have availability of anesthesia for patients um, to be able to have high throughput of patients? Well, it's critical. We, as UCSF, we have some issues with the anesthesia, but that was secondary to the location of where you scanner is. If I can say that going back 10 years ago, I will certainly put this machine in an inpatient setting with the ability to perform inpatients, not only outpatients, because that will be especially in some areas of the brain, could be very beneficial. And also for some pediatric patients would be extremely beneficial, but some small kids may require some sort of sedation. Mm -hmm. Not only because of the test, but also because of the MR itself. So that's why I think that having the ability to, to use sedation or anesthesia is, is of high value. Oh, thank you. There's a follow-up question. Uh, do you use um, the PETMR for many pediatric applications? Considering well, that, that is a great question, but I have a bad answer because of <laughs> and and you should not ask me this question because I'm going to say that unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't use it for a lot of pediatric applications, and the and the reason for that is mainly because of the location where the scanner is. We have a scanner that is probably 15 minutes away from the main children's hospital. So it's not an inpatient facility. Most of the kids that I will put on the PEDMR are kids that are 8, 10, 12. Some of them may require some sort of sedation. We don't do that. We do uh, older teenagers and then because they don't require anesthesia. So if you have a scanner that you can have small kids in that, I think that is a great technique for follow-up patients with lymphomas and sar sarcomas are two examples. There are many centers that are now using this technique preferentially in the pediatric population with great success. And also for the brain, also for the brain, patients with medulloblastomas, patients with um, pointing gliomas for research purposes, this is, is a, a device that could be very useful. Oh, that's great. It sounds like location and accessibility to anesthesia is critical for use for high use of the PEDMR. We have a few follow up questions. Um, it's uh, two great questions um, that could become, I guess, could be combined. Um, how are you billing for these studies to get reimbursement? And then how are you reading uh, these studies at UCSF? <laughs> what is the path? That's a great question. Probably we'll need another one hour discussion about this so in terms of the in terms of the billing okay from from a cpt perspective code there is not a single code from the PEDMR. they are considered two different techniques they have their own cpt codes pet and mr so 
what you do, you, you build for a whole body pad that it has their own CPT code, and then you build for the dedicated MR of the part of the body that you are more interested. Let's say a patient with a cervical cancer. You do a whole body pad and you do a CPT code of pelvic, of pelvic MR and you build for that. That is, you have two separate buildings. Hmm? Is a way that is right now because it's considered totally separate. In terms of the, of the interpretation, we, we, I mean, our goal is to maximize the ability and the expertise of the readers. What we do is that we always use people with specialty expertise in nuclear medicine and molecular imaging and let's say abdominal imaging, neuroradiology for that parts of the body that are part of the mark. So if, if, if there is a patient, let's say with liver cancer, we want to have somebody with abdominal imaging expertise for the MR and somebody with an expertise on the nuclear side for the FDG or the Dota T, whatever agent that is used. We tend to use a complementary approach on that. But tend to, uh, we want to, because it's an evolving technique, we want to have the maximum expertise in reading them. We don't want to fall down on that. It's, it's so difficult to implement it from a workflow, logistics perspective, engineering perspective, that we want to give the best. That's great. So um, it looks like, uh, in summary, you're able to uh, build for separate CPT codes, and then you do joint reports between different sections. Yes, that's right. And uh, I have one last question. Um, what sort of support do you need from the physicists, from the medical physics uh, section? Well, it's, it's relevant. It's relevant. Um, that's an interesting question because, I mean, there is always support from the vendor. So the PEDIMAR itself is something that is developing. There is constant upgrades to the software from the PET perspective, but especially from the MR perspective. There are up upgrades in terms of the sequences, in terms of shortening sequences, et cetera. Locally, we really need to have some sort of expertise that is a combination. We, I mean, our UCSF, we use expertise from um, engineering, and we use expertise as well from people that are more exp expert in um, basic research MR and nuclear medicine techniques to combine them. But but it is an evolving is an evolving field because it's a, it's relatively young, especially the implementation into the humans. Mm, I, I will suspect that the engineering part of the device is something that. Although it's becoming more standard, it all will always require a very tailored and dedicated expertise from as many people that you can put together. So it's not that somebody with expertise in nuclear can be the person to go for MR sequences implementation and vice versa, because they are too complex and putting them together in these devices is not easy. Well, Dr. Pampaluni, thank you so much for presenting at our Grand Rounds. Uh, it was a fantastic talk and we learned a lot. Uh, we probably will have even more questions as we're going to be bringing Pedimar here uh, to Yale. And um, we just want to thank you. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You know how to reach me. Any question you have, feel free to email me and I'll be more than delighted to answer you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care.